Something that's been really pissing me off on the internet lately is how everybody just feels the need to just be correct all the time. Everybody is so concerned about being right. Nobody's concerned about just having interesting ideas or conversations. Everybody wants to be correct about everything they say, everything they talk about. And I don't get it. Like, who gives a fuck? Who gives a fuck if you're even right about anything? Because chances are you're not. So, in the last episode, I raised some points that, of course, uh, got some contention going in the comment section. The biggest one that I was in trouble for in hot water was for even mildly suggesting the possibility that there was a nuanced debate on climate change. Now, let me make this very clear. I am not a climate, a man-made, particularly climate change, denier. I don't think that it's not real. That was not the point I was trying to make at all. My point is simply that you should always doubt everything because it's impossible to know what is ultimately correct or not. There are certain things that you can say are correct with a lot of confidence and you should live your life on the basis that those things are correct because that's the most effective way to live your life, but that doesn't make it correct. And in the comment section, it was really entertaining to see the different positions that people took uh, against it, where there are people saying things like, some people saying 90% of all scientists agree that it is, that it's real. Some were saying 99%. One guy who is a scientist said, it is mostly agreed upon, and it's true that a lot of what the contention is, is, is not, you know, is paid for by mega corporations who have an incentive to to say that it doesn't exist but i respect digi's skepticism because yeah you should always be skeptical that is the point of science is to constantly be rechecking and retesting and making sure because the more information comes to light, the more chances that the information you had before is wrong. You should never be resting on your laurels in the world of information. Never take a stance. Never think that you are at the end of the road and that you know what's going on. Because as soon as you make that decision, you are going to be proven wrong when the new information comes to light. Am I saying, oh, we can't prove that... Uh, that, that, you know, man-made climate change is real and therefore don't do anything about it. No. Am I saying, oh, like, you know, just because 10% of people disagree, that automatically means it's a contentious subject. Yes, I am saying that because there's a lot, a lot of things that 99% of people agree on and they're all wrong, including scientists. Because my point was that I don't trust anybody i don't trust anybody to be correct i don't trust you to have done your due diligence i don't trust you to have gotten all the facts straight i will put faith in you because i have to put faith in something to make it through life but that is not the same as accepting that what you have said is true and this is uh, i think this is a very important dividing line that most people don't make because most people feel like they have to take actions on the basis of their beliefs. You have to be true to your your feelings. And you that's just not the way to make it through life. You you don't have to be that way. It's like there's been this 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 argument lately that I, I agree with. That um well let me back it up. There are people who say things like, oh, how can you be anti-capitalist while participating in a capitalist system? And the other side will say, that's ridiculous. And they're right to say that because you can't not participate in it. Like if I'm born in America, raised in America, my goal is not to leave this system, but to change this system. I can't change this system by leaving it. I can't change the way that the country works by going to another country where things work differently. 
My goal is not to live in a communist society. It's to make America a communist society in this case. And so to say like, oh, how can you participate in the capitalist system? Well, what other means by which are you going to propagate your message? If you're speaking to capitalists in a capitalist system, how are you supposed to do that without engaging in capitalism? You, you can't. It's the, the means to the ends you know, like you, you can't just, uh, you can't just find a way to make that not happen. It's going to be necessary, but that's part of the way that you're trying to change things. So, you know, to say, oh, like, how can you participate in capitalism and be anti-capitalism? It's just like, you don't have to do things exclusively that you believe in. Like I pay taxes to the government. I don't believe in it. I don't think it's right. I think that the government is committing a crime by forcing me to give them money to do with it things that I don't want them to do, you know, the, and to to have a political system that does not allow me the power to, you know, make the changes that I would want to be made in service of, you know, having my money go to the right place. Like, I'm not anti-government. I want to get this out of the way, too, because people seem to think that just because I'm, like, pro-capitalism, I'm therefore just total anarcho-capitalist, which is not the case at all. I think that there is obviously a bunch of regulation that is, like, necessary to have a society. And besides, the point of all of it should be that we, the people, come to an agreement about what we think like what regulations we think need to be there and we vote on that and that's how those come to be. The reason that people like me don't trust the government is that it isn't on the basis of like what people think and what is popularly accepted. Um, most people are completely fucking uneducated on the subjects anyways. So most people don't even know what the fuck they're voting on because we don't teach anything political in a meaningful way in school. So, like, nobody even knows in the first place what they're, you know, they, they don't have the information to make the votes that they should make. And moreover, they don't vote on issues. You just vote for politicians to make the decisions for you. And as long as a politician represents a bunch of different issues, well, then it's always going to be muddied because you can't vote on which politician you want to make the economic decisions that you want them to make if they also stand for something completely different. And this is, like... It's so hard for me to, to get this into the heads of, like, certain people whose only concern is the economy. Because there are some people who are like, I don't care about any other issues, I just care about the economy. And it's like, okay, well, you have to understand that someone like, say, um, you know, uh, a, a mostly libertarian liberal, like somebody who votes Democrat but whose beliefs are largely libertarian, even if they if you broke down everything about like how society works, even if they would come down against socialism, the fact that the Republican candidate is going to be anti-abortion is enough to make them vote for the Democratic candidate. So as long as you care about that issue, the economic side of it is not even going to matter. It's not going to factor in. You're picking somebody to represent your jurisdiction on the basis that, oh, I don't want anti-abortion laws passed. So you vote for this guy who, you know, wrapped up in that is his pro-socialism because you don't get to vote on the fucking issues. You're just voting on a person. And all of the people who get involved in politics are inevitably going to be corrupted because they're entering the system that runs on corruption. Like, inherently, everything about this is stacked against you as a voter. There's, there's no way that you can make decisions that are going to have, like, you know, that are meaningfully going to move things in the direction of what you really want society to be, unless you really only, like, your only problems with society are these, like, nickel and dime shit that, you know, that comes up in the political discourse, as opposed to, like, the total restructuring that I think would be necessary to make things actually make sense. When I talk about how I'm pro-capitalism, it's not because I think, oh, we should, you know, vote for this guy who's going to make this and that change, and, it, and that'll just make everything good overnight. No, the system is fucking inexorably broken. It has to be repaired from the ground up. My call for uh, capitalism isn't because I think, like, um, you know, any change would be easy or, like, fast to make. It's more like if we had the opportunity to scorched earth and start over from the beginning and we had to choose between communism or capitalism as the way forward, I would say that a structured capitalism that, you know, was, was well 
thought out and took into account, you know, like what would really make sense for society to function would work better than the same, but it's communism. And they wouldn't be that different, you know, like in my mind, I don't think that trying to do either one the best possible way would be inherently bad. It's just that I want the less collectivist approach because I don't trust the collective, because I know that 90% of people can agree on something and it can be wrong. And I also want there to be a constant evolution of thought and for people to always be bringing new ideas and new perspectives to the table without fear of consequences. Because I don't want us to live in a society where somebody having a radical new idea is shut out because it doesn't fit in with what most people think. Because a lot of the time that radical new idea is the right idea. And we can, you know, look through history and see countless times where the, the radical idea was the right one and where the majority was wrong about the way things are. And yet people still want to invoke the majority as a way to justify why they think something is true. It's like, dude, I don't, why would that sway me? Why would, oh, most people think this way make me think that that means it's true when that historically is not even often the case. And so that's where I get into the whole correctness thing because... Everybody's trying to be as right as possible all the time, and what you're just doing is killing the uniqueness of your ideas. It's like you might not be able to express it in a way that makes sense, but as soon as you let that train of thought die just because somebody told you it was illogical, there's no more exploring it. You should be refining it. We should be having conversations about these unique ideas to try to get to the bedrock of where they're coming from. There's a lot of people who are probably correct about something and they don't know how to express it or they don't know how to logically map it out or just the thought leads down the course to a correct thought further down the line, something that hadn't been considered yet. And it's only by the discussion that we can come to hash out what they were really trying to get to, what has been picked up in the recesses of their mind that the, the, the language center can't describe yet. And so it pisses me off when people are like, oh, uh, you know, you're wrong about this thing. Here's what the people say. Here's like what the studies say. So shut the fuck up about it. No, don't shut the fuck up about it. Keep talking about it, but be open to changing, you know, elements of it. Be open to the fact that like, okay, well, if these are what the facts say, if these are what the statistics say, well, what about this version of what I've been positing? You know, let's, let's keep going until we find out if there is a, an intriguing idea in there. I just hate shutting down discussion. Anytime anybody's like, oh, this guy's wrong. Let's shut him up. It's just like, dude, Fucking, he has a dissenting opinion for a reason, and it could be just being misinformed, just being stupid, but I don't want to take that risk of shutting out, like, it's like as though, you know, let's think about this evolutionarily. Let's say that there's a, a lizard, and it suddenly grows a new arm. Like, the, you got a lizard that grows a fifth arm out, and all the other lizards are like, well, that mutation is stupid. What the fuck are you going to do with that fifth arm? And we found no application for it. So let's not fucking, let's, let's shut that lizard out. Let's not mate with it. Let's not fucking propagate this whole fifth arm thing. But then at some point, it becomes apparent that they find a use for that fifth arm. Like, oh, turns out you can hang from this vine uh, you know, from your fifth arm and use the other four arms to like hold on to a stick and you can draw a map, you know, even though you're a four armed creature, you can, you can, you, you have all four of your arms to grab onto something while the fifth arm holds you in place. Oh shit. Like we could have used that fifth arm, but we completely shut it out because we just didn't see what the usefulness of it was at the time. You know, like that's what we do if we, if we completely close off it, like we should explore it to uh, to the to the extent that we can. I mean, if it dies out, if we never find application for it, then it probably wasn't meant to be. But like, why make that decision at the beginning when you never know if this new evolution of the idea could lead to the next stage of evolution? It could be that we all wish we had that fifth arm a little while later. I also, of course, just hate the fucking snootiness of it. It always is just people wanting to be right about something so that they can lord it over other people. It's basically the new form of bullying. It's a form of bullying that is socially acceptable because the way that we all work, this is just in endemic to human nature. You, you've definitely seen people talk about it, heard about it in art. You know, any conversation about bullying surrounds the fact that 
We make others feel weak to feel better about ourselves. If we feel weak, if we feel powerless, we want to make someone else feel weak or feel powerless. We want to inflict onto someone else what's being done to us. And if we're frustrated because we feel like we live in a world that doesn't account for what we think it should be, if we think that you know people are wrong and that it's, it's causing us harm, then we want to lash out at other people who we see as, you know, contributing to the problem. It's like, oh, you're wrong about something. You're the reason I'm in pain. Your wrongness is why I am suffering. So fuck you. So we are, we're just eager to call people out to be like, oh, you're wrong. And like, it gives you such a fucking boner to be right and to just own somebody and be like, yeah, that motherfucker was wrong. And I made sure everybody knew it. I made sure they knew it. I made sure the world knew it. You know, I understand where that comes from, but it's just, there's no benefit to it. There's no benefit to like attacking people for being wrong when you could just have a reasonable conversation. Like if you think someone's wrong, it, particularly if you're hoping to change their mind, the approach is not aggression. It's not to like be angry at them for being wrong. Like people can't help ignorance. You can't help what you don't know. If you've never learned something, why would you know it? Like, you know, I can't even be like that mad at like, say somebody who's like horribly racist. Like the reason people are racist is usually ignorance. It's not because they know what the other races are like and have decided they hate that. It's because they straight up have wrong ideas about people of that race. They think that they are something that they are not. And if you educate them, you can change that. You can make them think differently. And granted, if they're being like an aggressive asshole, then I would completely understand meeting that with aggressive assholeness in return. But it's not the most effective strategy. Like, I'm not saying you shouldn't or can't do that, but it's not going to be the most likely to succeed strategy. The most likely to succeed strategy is always going to be to be patient, calm, informational, to try to educate people in a way that will reach them. Figure out what you can tell somebody that, you know, in a calm, reasonable manner that will that will help to change their perspective and you can help them change their mind. Being aggressive, attacking somebody is never going to have better odds of accomplishing that than trying to take an approach that is patient and understanding of their ignorance. That is just, that's what being a good teacher is. And if your goal is to teach somebody, then that should be your approach. If your goal is not to teach them, if your goal is I'm angry and I just want to take it out on you for being wrong, I see you as the problem and you piss me off so I'm going to get back at you by attacking you for your wrongness, you're just being an asshole. And like, that's fine. Go ahead. Have fun. But you're just being an asshole. You're not accomplishing anything. You're not progressing society. Don't lie to yourself and think that it's okay, that you're just a, that you're a perfectly fine person for doing it. You are just a weak-minded person who has been hurt by society and you're taking it out on other people. And you think it's morally justified because those people are wrong in your eyes. But those people are either ignorant or... If they are wrong, they they can be corrected and you could be doing something better if you really want to help. So, you know, don't think that calling people out about being wrong about shit is ever justified morally when the alternative is always going to be more helpful. So I've been kind of floating this idea around for a while, talking about it here and there, but I really got to re-emphasize this because I, I don't think enough can be said about it. The idea that just a few people, I think, can create the majority of all the chaos that is happening in the world around us. And it's really difficult, I think, for the average person to understand the amount of chaos that's possible that you can generate by just deciding to go against the script of whatever you have decided for yourself. I mean, most of us, most of us are pretty set into doing things the way that society has, has told us is most okay. And even beyond that, we have a kind of concrete sense of identity. We have an idea of who we are, and we try to operate within that idea. 
And so if we have this sense of like, okay, I am like a nerd, I hang out, I stay at home, I play video games, um, I watch anime, like I consume internet content, that's what I do, that's my life, that's who I am, you make a mission to be true to that identity. And maybe there's something you want to change about yourself and, you know, you, you work your way through trying to evolve in that direction but without losing grasp of the parts of yourself that you like. There are other people who do not think that way. They do not look at themselves in terms of, like, the actions that they take or, like, the the identity that they project as being who they are. They're not concerned about what they show you being the same thing as what they feel inside. And they certainly are not set on a track of, like, doing the same kind of thing. They're not thinking about what is the social expectation. They're not concerned about what their actions will mean to other people. They just operate on their whims of what they think will serve themselves in the moment. Now, I want you to think about, for instance, stealing. This is the most simple example I can give. Because the average person doesn't steal probably at all you probably don't usually steal shit maybe every once in a blue moon you'll take something from a store but for the most part most people do not steal why well you have a fear of getting caught you have a fear of you know doing something morally wrong just going against the script of how you understand yourself like personally i'm not even really that morally averse to stealing like, you know, if you're if you're stealing from, like, a, a major corporation or whatever, I don't really give a shit, um, but I wouldn't do it because it just isn't who I am. It's not something I would do. I have the money to pay for things. I would prefer to take the least chaotic option possible of how I acquire things because I don't know what the results will be. Maybe I'll get caught. Maybe I'll get banned from a store. Maybe I will feel guilty. I don't know, but I just know that all of those things are are more chaotic and I could just take the simpler option of not doing it. But if I didn't have that instinct, if I didn't have that feeling and I was just stealing shit, like that's who I am, I steal shit, it is so easy for one person to steal an enormous amount of shit. All you got to do is go to Walmart, steal something, then go across the street to Target steal something, go to the 7-Eleven, steal something, hey, you got three meals for the day, all stolen, it's not hard to steal from these places, a lot of them don't even have policies to chase you down, because so few people will actually do it, that it's easier for them to just eat the loss of whatever you took, than it is for them to try to hunt you down and persecute you, and they could get in lawsuits if they do, if they hurt you in any way, so it's just easier for them to ignore it. And there are people who know that, and they just take advantage of it. They just go, yeah, uh, I steal shit. That's what I do. And, and I've known people, I've known several of my friends have stolen hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars worth of merchandise from Target and Walmart. Because at some point in their life, at some point when they, they just didn't care about the consequences for one reason or another, they just decided to see what they could get away with basically and just took ass loads of shit and then at a time in their life later when they had more to lose and were not so willing to you know to take a risky maneuver such as that it curbed it considerably because you're just not thinking that way anymore you're not thinking about you know, not caring about what kind of chaos your actions make. And I think this is why, by and large, so much crime, especially petty crime, is committed by teenagers, particularly who come from broken homes, people who are in bad living situations, because when you're a teenager and you don't have any way to put your life into your own hands, when you're not responsible for the reasons that your life is shitty or that you're emotionally damaged, you just feel like, okay, well, you know, nobody's treating me like my life matters, so I'm not going to treat them like their lives matter or like, you know, what they're up to matters. You just have a, a more nihilistic take and you just feel like you can do whatever the hell you want because what could possibly happen to you that's going to be worse than just living a life you're dissatisfied with anyways and having no control? 
That's why teenagers tend to commit these kinds of crimes. Now imagine if you never graduated from that mindset, or even worse yet, if you had the mindset that you're supposed to take things from people, that it's supposed to be every man for himself, survival of the fittest, you know, you you reject the notion that the best way to make it through society is to participate, you know, in, in what everybody thinks is like the moral paradigm of the culture. If instead you think, oh, it is an imperative for me to just get whatever I want through whatever means necessary. Well, if you think that way, which, you know, we, we dub sociopathy, um, then you are not concerned about any of this shit. You're not trying to live morally. You're not trying to live to any code of conduct other than get what I want. And people who are that way can create so much chaos. And there's no better microcosm of this than the documentary I just watched from Porcelain. I talked about his, uh, I think, Sargon documentary on one of these episodes of The Whirling Dervish before. But his new one on the Isaleb Baked Alaska is absolutely fascinating. Because he follows the, the journey of this guy who basically just says, does, takes on whatever identity he thinks will get him the most attention at the time. And it's only now that enough time has passed that he's continued shifting identities, that there's enough records of him, you know, over the years on the internet that people have, like, a solid idea of exactly what he's about, that he has been, you know, that he's been completely fake the entire time, basically. But when you look back through the history of it, it's astonishing that this dude literally does not have an identity, other than he wants to be e-famous and he will take on whatever properties will allow him to have that. And so, in his efforts to do that, he just constantly embodies the most extreme ideologies possible and pumps that out into the world at an effuse rate. This is the guy who was at... Now, I, I didn't know much about this, but there was this big rally that happened in Charlottesville, Virginia, where they were removing a statue of Robert E. Lee. And a bunch of right-wing internet people gathered together to have this rally against the removal of this statue. And it's obviously a publicity stunt. It's obviously to get eyes on those people, um, you know, since a lot of them are the, the ones leading the movement are a bunch of internet celebrities who have nothing but to gain by having their name put out there for this movement. Like, all they want is more viewership. That's why they want this thing to happen. And meanwhile, there's the counterforce of everybody who has a reason to oppose it. Because it means the same thing for them. It's also good press. It also, you know, will recruit people to their side. So this is just a battle for the minds of the viewer. It's a battle for whichever side you feel like you agree with more, come subscribe to my YouTube channel. And Baked Alaska is at the heart and center of it. And he's out there in the streets leading these, like, white supremacist chants and shit, like, egging the crowd into being more violent, more energetic. He's trying to hype these people up for the idea that this rally is, like, this real serious thing so that violence will escalate out of it, so that it will be a bigger news story. And then as soon as the violence does break out, he immediately fakes getting hit with pepper spray so that he's removed from the equation right before things go to shit, and the whole thing, you know, someone ends up getting killed, and the whole thing becomes an optics nightmare for the people who organized it. Um, this is essentially his fault. Like, it's him just, his predilection for chaos, his decision that he's going to maximize the attention he can get from this event. It has nothing to do with his actual beliefs, or really anyone's beliefs, because all it is is inciting a mob. And a mob, they're not driven by their, the you know, the way they feel. They're driven by the mob mentality. It's, I'm on this team, we're all getting riled up, we're getting our energy, our blood going. You know, it's that war instinct that people have that drives that mob to violence. And this guy exists for no purpose but to stoke that. He organized this whole thing so that he could incite violence to draw attention to himself. And then, 
shifts sides when it's no longer cool for him to be on the right when he's too in trouble with the people in his own camp. He swaps sides to the other side and tries to curry favor with those people. But it doesn't work because after a certain point, everybody can tell this guy's fake as fuck since he'd already been flip-flopping his ideologies the entire time. It's, it's badly planned, and living chaotically has a tendency to burn you out quickly because the world is not, society rather, is not structured around chaos. It's structured around the opposite. It's structured around trying to mitigate chaos, trying to make things orderly so that more people can live better. But when you have this extra layer of the internet over top of everything where chaos thrives so much more easily because there is no coherent system, there's no regulation, the older people don't even understand it, so they're not even there to offer guidance. It's just a bunch of young people believing whatever they read and fucking running with it and going completely apeshit and allowing just sociopathy to reign supreme because it's unchecked. There's not enough people punishing you for doing sociopathic shit, for, you know, rampant doxing, for attacks on people. Like, there's nothing to regulate all of that. So it's just a chaotic maelstrom. And when it bleeds over into reality, because it is reality, it's all real, it's all happening, it's real people, even though people are using the fact that it has that distance, that extra layer of masking to, you know, they use that to their advantage to be this other character, to be able to switch sides and flip-flop and, you know, ride the tides of misinformation. And it's, again, only now that we're finally, like, we've had this for long enough and we can look back through enough history that we have people like Porcelain who can go back through it all and, ch you know, check it. Just check the work, see what's really going on, and then make a documentary about it, you know? And, and hopefully, as people watch this, they start to realize more and more how much of the internet is fucking fake. How much of it is unbelievably fucking fake. Because most of the people who are leading the movements are just out for attention and money. That's all they want. They might have some kind of ideology at the heart of it, but they're all pumping that up to the maximum extreme level of expression so that they can get more attention because more attention means more followers, means more money. And the people who are following them just want to be a part of something. They don't even have these extreme of beliefs in the beginning, but because they want to be in a club and they want to have an enemy and they want to have that radicalization that makes them feel like they're doing something... That's why they follow these people. This is what cult following is. And it's all fake. It's all the, 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 the fucking, the sociopaths leading the blind into battle with each other. And it creates this image of this massive war that's not even real. It's everything's blown out of proportion. Everything, anybody who has a reason to report on what's going on is, the reason is money. The reason is always money. If they, if there's a news report about some insane shit that some SJW said, and like people in the comments are all, oh, SJWs are so fucking crazy. I can't believe they, they believe this. They don't. Either one person, one idiot does, and they just reported on it because they knew it would be inflammatory, or no one does. And somebody just made it up so that they could report on it. So that it could make that side look stupid so that they can make money off of it. And the same goes on the other camp. Every time you hear like, oh my god, someone said this incredibly racist fucking thing. It's like, yeah, okay, well, that's one person. Like, we, we pump everything up into like, oh, everybody who disagrees with me is absolutely fucking insane. If that was true, we wouldn't even have a society. If enough people believed the insane shit the internet thinks people believe then we wouldn't be able to manage this world that we've crafted, this incredibly complex system that we're all participating in. Because people would just be fucking crazy and doing crazy shit all the fucking time. But it's mostly an act. It's mostly just people performing characters for attention, for self-gratification, and for money. And it's really disgusting the way that it's affected people's lives so dramatically. I would say the worst culprit, and I, I don't want to be somebody who comes out against 
this, but the Me Too movement is fucking heinous. And we've just seen where the guy who did uh, the Screen Junkies leader, who was like one of the first people who was attacked by this movement, who tons and tons of people just thought he was a sex predator. And now that he's finally finished with his court cases on it, he's revealed all the evidence of how the accusations against him were provably bullshit, that it provably was not real. He never did anything illegal at all. Never raped anybody. It doesn't even seem like he did anything really questionable other than cheat on his wife, which, you know, who gives a shit? That's not a moral crime. It's just a, a shitty thing for a guy to do that really has nothing to do with anyone. But this this guy didn't, he didn't fucking do anything and he had his whole career ruined. And then we've seen it happen again and again because it's so easy. It's so easy to get attention. It's so easy to get ahead in life. And you really need to look at the motives of the people doing this shit. You really need to know who is making these accusations and why. Because, yeah, I'm sure that some of these have been real serious cases where people have done really heinous things. But, like, anybody can make that seem true. So, yes, I do think there's a huge problem in this country where... Um, women are not trusted enough, uh, when it comes to rape allegations, like there's, there's a lot more rape that goes on than is reported. And there's a lot more of it than people are willing to come out about. But the fact that people are using that to their advantage to just, you know, ruin people's careers and whole lives is a, a deep problem with our society. And to act as though, you know, we should like, oh, well, just... Believe all women all the time. Do not do that. Believe people who you can trust. Don't believe anybody, ever. Never believe anyone unless you trust them, and you have to have good fucking reason to do that. Do not trust shit. Why are you trusting anything? You should not be doing that. That is fucking retarded. Stop trusting shit you don't know. Vet your fucking sources. Find out as close to the truth as you can before you believe something. Jesus Christ, why would you ever support the idea of just trusting things blindly? That's fucking retarded. God damn. What the fuck is going on? I have, I barely am awake. I've been in a fucking weed coma. I made the mistake of buying $100 of marijuana and smoking it in three days. And now I feel like a brain dead zombie. But what? Could send me cry to open the door. It's too fucking echoey here. What could have caused me to come crawling up from my grave? But the funniest thing that I've ever seen in my life. That it took, it took a long time to get here. And this is maybe an odd moment for it to happen. But, uh, you know. You never know when, when anything's gonna happen on the internet, do you? You never know when you're gonna wake up and... Suddenly, everything's completely different, or or at least vastly changed from how you last understood it. Um, Maddox called me a pedophile on Twitter today. So, that sentence is either really hilarious to you, or you have no idea what I'm talking about. Because you probably don't even fucking know about Maddox anymore. Maddox used to be one of the most famous names on the internet. He was once a... A very popular website owner. He runs a site called The Best Page in the Universe. And uh, I read a lot of it in the mid-2000s, particularly because there was an anime blogger I'm a fan of named Bakaraptor who basically was doing Maddox's style but for anime and uh, was a big fan. And so he had introduced me to Maddox, and uh, I've been reading him since for over a decade. You know, I have his book, The Alphabet of Manliness, Um I would have considered myself a big fan, and I especially loved the podcast he did with Dick Masterson, um, The Biggest Problem in the Universe. All throughout, I was a huge fan of both hosts. I really liked Maddox's YouTube content. I generally thought he was a great internet creator. But in the time since the podcast that he did with Dick has ended, two things have happened. Two major transformations. One... Maddox has become a garbage content creator, and two, Maddox has become a garbage human being. These things have happened in tandem, and uh, there is pretty much nobody on his side. 
This is not a case of somebody changed and now a lot of people don't like the direction they're going in. This is a case of a man has become a complete social pariah and is still acting like it hasn't happened. It's very strange. You will never see another person be this hated by this many people and continue to insist that it's not real. Continue to live inside of a lie where there is anybody who gives a fuck about them or their content or doesn't think that they're a massive asshole. And this all basically happened because even though Dick Masterson is also an asshole, by his own admittance, he is not somebody who's ever been even trying to not be an asshole. Kind of the conceit of their show is that they're two assholes complaining about stuff. So that's not a surprise. But just because of the fact that Dick didn't do anything that by any means um, called for what Maddox did to him and what Maddox did was to ruin his career as an L.A.-based comedian, um, attempt to sue him and a bunch of other people related to the show for a ridiculous sum of money, uh, for like $400 million. Um, $20 million a piece, basically, for each person. The, the suit was laughable, completely laughed out of court, big failure. If you haven't seen um, my lecture I did on the hottest goss in the universe, I go through the whole story, and I'm very charitable to Maddox, in spite of the fact that, like, anybody would point out that he has massively fucked up, and the fact that he can't even cop to that is basically the reason that he's in the situation he is now, where, like, most people, by this point, after failing as unbelievably hard as Maddox did in such a like, unrecoverable way, where it's like, you really need to apologize profusely and also make something really great. That's the only way Maddox could come back. He could. He still could, to this day, come back if he apologized profusely and made something good. Because people on the internet are extremely forgiving. I know this. I've seen so many people get forgiven so easily. All you have to do is admit you were wrong, show that you're planning to change, and then make good things because that's the most important part. I mean, you don't even necessarily have to apologize that hard. Like, think about JonTron. That guy got in so much trouble for his debate with Destiny that his entire Reddit board turned against him and started supporting somebody else. Like, that's pretty far gone where your own fans don't even like you anymore. And yet... He managed to basically just say, hey, sorry, I handled it badly. I'm not going to talk about politics anymore. And then just make videos that people liked. And he's still a massive channel. It's that easy to do. Um, what Maddox has done is pretty heinous. But he doesn't even appreciate that. He still thinks he's the good guy. He still thinks that all of his actions have been justified. And no one agrees. No one. Not a single person. Not even his friends. Not even people who try to work with him because they think that he's an opportunity for them. Even though they, they are slowly realizing he's not. Because he's not relevant. And everybody on the internet hates him. And that's that's all he has. There's no one else who's going to watch his stuff. Like He can't just suddenly get discovered by a whole new audience. And expect to pull the numbers he used to have with his own audience. His audience are the people who hate him now. Because his audience all got into this podcast that he was doing that was really good. And then the new podcast he did afterwards sucked balls. And the one that his co-host did was great and told all the information about the other podcast and, you know, just came out on top. Like anyway, Maddox is retarded is what I'm trying to say. Maddox is straight up retarded. He is very stupid. He does not know how to manage his life. He has completely failed at everything he should be doing. And he seems to have finally reached the point where he's just lashing out in anger. And it's amazing it's taken this long. Because Maddox, I mean, he's been on the down low lashing out where he talks to anybody who basically says, I'm a fan of you and I don't want to use this information against you. Um... In spite of the fact that those people are always lying, he will can nonetheless continue to give them information because he's, I don't know, extremely gullible and massively autistic. So he basically will just, you know, hand out information and bitch and whine about the other side. But even to people who he seemingly trusts, he will not admit 
any fault on his part. He has not dropped it at all. And now, so this is where shit gets weird. So, like, his biggest accusation against Dick Masterson um, that had basically costed Dick his job at UCB, um, which is a comedy theater in L.A., was that Dick had been had been a rape defender or something. He had defended... I don't even know exactly how to phrase it. He was a rape apologist. That's what he called him, which is an insane thing that is probably mostly not real. Um, I don't know if there's anybody who apologizes for rape. It's retarded. But um, so he accused Dick of being a rape apologist, played some quotes from him out of context that even listening to them out of context, you can tell do not mean what Maddox is trying to say they mean, but he combines this with the idea that Dick's website is maintaining a rape list, by which he means that on the 8chan thread for the Dick show that has no connection to anyone involved in it at all, somebody had made a thread called Rape List and posted pictures of various women, some of whom had ties to the show. Nothing to do with Dick at all, but it's in his video. So this is important because 8chan was recently taken down and people who are okay with 8chan being taken down or are just generally criticizing 8chan are getting flack from Maddox because of the fact that they didn't decry 8chan back when he was complaining about it when he attacked Dick. It's very confusing. Like, there, there it seems to be that this guy who had said... That, you know, who who probably had just said, you know, this 8chan board has nothing to do with Dick Masterson, because it doesn't, is now getting attacked by Maddox because he didn't think 8chan was bad enough before. I don't know. It's very fucking confusing. Maddox, he's totally lost it. But he's just going ape shit in the responses. And, of course, this is causing a shitstorm because... If Maddox talks about anything publicly, it's going to be scrutinized. He rarely does. He usually only talks to people behind closed doors. He, because he hasn't admitted any wrongdoing, anytime he does speak out publicly, he immediately gets ass blasted. But, like, that's what he's doing. He's just blowing, he's he's becoming, he's ass blasting on Twitter, getting all pissed off, and people are responding to him, and he's responding to them, and he's just making himself look, once again, like a total moron who nobody likes, who everybody wonders, what the fuck are you doing? So somebody tweets at him, how do you feel about the fact that he has, that Dick has an unapologetic pedophile on his show, this guy Digibro? Now, obviously, I'm not a pedophile. I think this guy was probably mostly joking, but Maddox responds, Ruh-oh. And then, in his responses to someone else, where he's trying to make the argument for why it's... Because generally, his response to people criticizing him is that you are morally repugnant for enjoying the Dick show because of the fact that Dick is a rape apologist and that he's had on all these untoward people and granted even from comparably sane people the biggest argument against the dick show is usually who it platforms like you know richard spencer or something i don't think he's actually had him on the show but like you know the fact that dick is even willing to talk to that guy is enough to make a lot of people say oh you can't listen to the dick show which is ridiculous um we talked about that before though but this guy is more like, oh, Dick had on person who I've heard of and don't like, so you shouldn't listen to him. Um, so his response to this guy was, even though Dick's had on um, felons like Lettuce Jones and pedophiles like Digibro and uh, the Ghost Gunner guy. Um, and I just looked at it and I went, oh my God, Maddox just called me a pedophile. Maddox, who doesn't know anything about me. Literally nothing. This guy could not pause. He probably doesn't even know I made a big-ass video about him and Dick and their whole controversy. I'm sure he wouldn't watch it. I bet he has never even heard of me. He just saw somebody said, oh, this guy who calls into his show is a pedophile and his name's Digibro. And he went, ammunition. Oh, he's got pedophiles listening. Even though, even though. This very same thing happened to Maddox when he had two proven pedophiles on his show for long stretches of time. 
even though one of his earliest big defenders was David Clegg, who Monkey Jones and Cream Man had proved was an active pedophile courting underage girls. And he's a huge Maddox fan who Maddox embraced. And also he had another guy, I don't know his name, but he had a, another guy who was a proven pedophile who was on the show for a long time. When it came to Maddox's attention, he axed him. But for Maddox to blindly and baselessly follow this idea that there is a pedophile on Dick's show named Digibro and do no follow-up at all is absolutely amazing. And of course, it's a lot of people are just going to think this is a hilarious meme because there's not a ton of people who really defend me on this front other than my own fans you know amongst the dick show guys this is just hilarious and they you know immediately has and cruz was like how funny would it be if digibro sued maddox for uh slander and i was like yeah i mean i have a better fucking case than he did you know what did they call him a cuck he just called me a pedophile you know with no basis at all so yeah uh maddox what the fuck are you thinking do you want to get sued do you want to get, like, do you want to piss me off? I have a bigger audience than you do, Maddox. You know, the funny thing is, I've had times where I thought about, what if I tried to get into contact with Maddox and coach him into recovering his career? Because I think I could do it. Like, Maddox is hard-headed and very autistic, but the way he communicates is something I'm kind of used to, having dealt with a lot of hard-headed autistic people in my life. And... I feel like I, you know, I'm somebody who's pretty good at marketing. I've managed to have a successful YouTube channel. Like, Maddox topped out around the sub count that I have. Like, he was around 350,000 at his height. And he was pulling decent numbers, but just every decision he's made about where to go with this content since then has made no fucking sense. And he's completely broke. He's like taking public transit. He lives in a house with a bunch of other dudes. He does not have any money to throw around and he's not making any money. And he's like whoring himself out to all this LA bullshit that has nothing to do with how he got successful. Like, but because he got successful so early, he never really had to market. Like all he had to do was just be funny early on the internet when there was nobody else there. He does not understand how to survive on the modern internet. And I do. And I could help him with that. Just because I think it would be funny to see him come back, you know, to see if Maddox remained a name on the internet and what would happen. Like, I want to see people um, trying to decide whether or not they can forgive him if his content was good again. Which I don't even know if his content could be good again, but I want to see how it makes people feel. To see, like, if Maddox was making stuff that was at least good enough that you wanted to watch it, would it change the way you felt about his massively awful character you know and maybe we could get him to change somewhat or admit some wrongdoing here and there but no uh obviously all of that is out the window i have no desire to help maddox because he's a dumb bastard and a piece of shit who will throw people under the bus who he's never even heard of just throw out just throw out the most heinous things he's heard about somebody who he literally doesn't know anything about maddox you're a piece of shit i hope you really appreciate that like that's what's so amazing about this, is that this guy is being a piece of shit in full view of everyone, and everyone's telling him that that's what he's doing, and he doesn't get it. He just doesn't see it. There's not a single person telling him that what he's doing is okay. And yet somehow, he still thinks he's in the right. He must just think everyone else is retarded. And granted... Most people are pretty retarded, Maddox, but you are also stupider than most people. You are actually probably in the dumber percentile of humanity, uh, as evidenced by the fact that everything you're doing is backfiring and you have no idea how to get yourself out of it. So, you know, uh, I'm just going to point and laugh at this point. Like, if you're going to call me a pedophile, I can say whatever I want about you. I can go and make... I could, you know, use your corpse as a pinata if I so desire. I could make anything out of making fun of you because you have no moral high ground. Literally, nobody's on your side. 
And if you come after people who have nothing to do with you and no reason to come after you and you give them a reason to come after you, you're just making it worse for yourself. You're just making one more enemy, one more guy with an audience who hates your guts and is going to do everything he can to make sure everybody knows it. This is foolish behavior. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, that's why I wanted to make a dervish about it. Like, I can't even be that mad because Maddox is such a laughing stock. Like, imagine five years ago if it was like, oh, one of my heroes, Maddox, thinks I'm a piece of shit on the internet. I mean, I probably wouldn't have even taken it seriously. I probably would have thought it was a joke. But, like, to think of it now, it's just like, wow. The most hated, despised man on the internet is trying to use me as a stepping stone out of him looking as bad as somebody else. Bruh. There is nobody. Like, you, even like like Dick said, throwing Lettuce Jones under the bus is not even fair. That man paid his dues. He, he, went, to, he went to prison. He served his time. You know, um, Lettuce Jones has moral, more moral character and more foothold for sympathy on the internet than Maddox by a long shot. Maddox, you fucked up. You fucked up real bad. And it's unbelievable that it's been this long and you still don't get it. Unfucking believable You are one of the stupidest men on the internet. Anyway... That's it for this episode of Art So Far, So Swirling Dervish. It was postponed a bit because I went to Otakon. I felt good after Otakon. I didn't really have anything to whirl and dervish and rage about. You know, ideas come into my head every once in a while, but if it doesn't get the blood boiling, if it doesn't feel like I have to talk about this right now or else it's going to explode, then I don't, I don't want to cover it as much. You know, I want to keep these raw and pure and even short if they have to be. Do you have any parting comments, Pantsu Party, about... Um, seeing Maddox call me a pedophile on Twitter. Fuck you, Maddox. Well, you heard it there. She gave a middle finger as well. Uh, be sure to listen to this on all the platforms that are linked in the description. Share it with people. Tell, tell the people you know. Get everybody listening to my goddamn whirling dervish. Alright, that's it.